The New York Times, a former newspaper, has issued a new style book to its reporters intended to minimize the occurrence of anything that might make them feel unsafe, like journalism. Times executives were reluctant to issue the style book in printed form because they feared that might look too harsh for the reporter's sensitive eyes and might create a conflict in which the privileged white background of the page could overwhelm the marginalized black print. Instead, the Times produced the style book in the form of a talking cabbage patch doll dressed in a checkered onesie and delivered to the desks of journalists by a cartoon stork. The journalists then pull the string of the doll and it recites the style book in gentle, childlike tones reminiscent of a babbling toddler or indeed of the journalists themselves. The style book's words will be accompanied by a selection of music box lullabies ranging from Hush Little Baby to the International. The new guidelines include these rules. One, black people are magic. They are almost holy figures who cannot even be looked upon, especially when they're looting a Costco. Only when the sacred... Only when the sacred essence of black existence is recognized by reporters will we begin to be able to speak of them without being hounded out of a job or sued for more money than we care to spend on telling the truth. Two, Donald Trump is also magic, only his magic is very dark. Everything he does and says is very bad and evil. He cannot be covered objectively because if you did that, he would devour your mother. He would be like the evildoer who can't be named in the J.K. Rowling books if J.K. Rowling hadn't said that transgender women weren't actually women, so that she has become the evildoer who can't be named instead. Three, we apologize. Whatever we said, we're sorry. Also, we resign. We will seek forgiveness at the feet of black people who are magic. The Times style book is available on request. Diapers sold separately. Good morning. I'm Andrew Claven, and this is the Andrew Claven Show. I feel hunky dunky. Life is tickety boo. Birds are winging, also singing. Hunky dunky dee Ship shaped, tipsy topsy. The world is a bitty zing. It's a wonderful day. Hooray, hooray. It makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray. Oh, hooray. All right. I can't believe you get this level of satire for free. It is it's a, it's criminal. So you should so- sign up for my YouTube channel, the Andrew Clavin YouTube channel, where you get all these openings, which a lot of times are too hot to run on the actual Daily Wire site. I'll be gobsmacked if they actually put that one up. But uh, you do get them whole and live uh, right there, whole on, on video right there on the YouTube channel. And recently, I can't believe this. I cannot believe how small and petty Michael Knowles has gotten. He has been competing with me to get more. I mean, I I would never do this to him, but he has been competing with me to get more subscriptions on his, and he has actually outstripped me. So I want you guys here, and we're following your comments too. Here's one from Feeling Dangerous 113. He says, I will unsubscribe from Knowles' channel if this gets featured tomorrow. So I just, I feature that without comment, <laughs> but, you know, you get the message, right? You understand the dog whistle here, what I'm saying to you. All right. One of the central themes of this show is that the major problem in this country, the major problem in this country is not the people. It's the wall of lies, what I call the empire of lies that stands between the people and the truth. And I'm talking, of course, about the devil's trinity, the academy, the press and the entertainment industry, three businesses which are defined by the fact that their assertions are never tested against real life. They can sell us socialism, but they never have to take responsibility for the utter failure of socialism everywhere. They can demonize conservative voices and censor uh, conservative voices, but they never have to confront the fact that it's almost always conservative solutions that actually solve our problems, while left-wing solutions almost always make them worse. And they can demonize America without facing what the world would look like if America were, were gone. Spoiler alert, it would look bad. But of all the things they do, all the things the Empire of Lies does, the cultural crimes they commit, the worst of them, I think, may be their demonic work on race. Race is a creation of racists. Racists racists create racism. There are genetic traits, there are ethnicities, there are cultures. No one expects the average Italian from Italy to behave in the same way as the average Englishman from England or the Maasai tribesman from Kenya. But we're all children of God made in God's image, and we can act that way. But if we're all going to live in the same country, this country, we have to treat each other like children of God and like we're made in God's image. And we have to accept the values that arise from that assertion, namely Western values, 
American values, e pluribus unum, right? Out of the many, one. Because we already know what a world of identity politics looks like. We already know what it looks like when we cling to our race and we cling to our racial identity. It looks like war and hatred. That's the history of the world up till now. Up till now, it's all been identity politics. That changed. The possibility of change was created with the creation of America and the idea of the melting pot. That's the new idea. Identity politics is the old idea. The progressives are always progressing into the past. But the empire of lies has so dominated the narrative that they make it impossible to talk without talking about race. Even I have started talking about black people as if somehow black people are a separate entity, a race different from other people, when really the fact is they benefit from the same things as everyone else, faith, a good job, marriage, morality, and they suffer if they are treated differently as in affirmative action or black lives matter or being absolved of personal responsibility for their own betterment when the rest of us have to do it ourselves. Right now, this moment, I know the empire of lies has struck back and scored what looks like a major victory in dividing us and in keeping our citizens of color under the boot heel of their infantilizing left wing systems. It is time for us to grab our lightsabers like Jedi because the movie ain't over yet. All right, let us talk about LifeLock because you got to protect yourself online. You've got to do it because you can just be going along. You think nobody, who would want your information, right? You know, you're not the most important guy. You're not a gazillionaire. Who would want your information? They are out there. The bad guys are out there. And now the April 15th tax filing deadline was pushed off to July 15th. So it's still up ahead. And that's a good thing. But the extension also gives additional time to fraudsters to mine for data to sell. Proactive approaches to protection are more important than than ever, the Government Accountability Office found that fraudsters used false identities to steal at least $1.68 billion in tax refunds in 2016. Don't let it happen to you. LifeLock is a leader in identity theft protection. If you become a victim of identity theft, and this is a big deal because it's so hard to put Humpty Dumpty back together again once they do steal your identity, but LifeLock can help you restore your identity easier than what you can do on your own. LifeLock detects a wide range of identity threats like your social security number for sale on the dark web, and they will alert you to that. No one can prevent all identity theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses, but LifeLock can see threats that you might miss on your own. Join now and save up to 25% off your first year. Go to LifeLock.com slash Clavin. That's lifelock.com slash Clavin for 25% off. Most of you have to go on the dark net if you want to find out how to spell Clavin, but I'm telling you for free, it is K-L-A-V-A-N. You are too so, smart to be acting this dumb. <laughs> exactly. So, all right, let's let's begin by talking about the funeral uh, in in Houston yesterday of uh, George Floyd. I always, always want to call him Lloyd George, like the prime minister, George Flo- George Floyd. And you know, Candace Owen uh, put out a video talking about his criminal career, Floyd's criminal career. And I haven't talked about that much because the guy is dead. I don't want to speak ill of the dead. And neither. And that's and obviously that's no excuse for what the cop did and the fact that he was killed. But that wasn't Candace's point. The point she was making is it's not good. It is not good for people to hagiographize, to make a saint out of a guy like that. Right. It's, it is one thing to say to mourn him. It's one thing for his family to mourn him. But to elevate him as a saint is not a good thing. Yesterday, for the first time ever, an Air Force general named Charles Brown Jr. was confirmed by the Senate as the first black guy ever to head a major branch of the military. And he spoke very movingly about living in two worlds, coming up in two worlds, the world of being an Air Force guy and the world of being a black guy and sometimes being treated differently, often being treated differently. I have a lot of respect for that. And you can hear that message and we can discuss that message as individuals among us, right? Because here's a hero. Here's a guy who's for us all. He's an American. He's an American hero. That's the kind of person you want to put ahead. And it is the left and it is the media that elevates the people who shouldn't be elevated as role models for people who need better models than that. So I'm only going to play one scene from the funeral. I want to just play this Al Sharpton cut who was giving the eulogy. Uh, This is cut 13. We are not fighting some disconnected incidents. We are fighting an institutional systemic problem that has been allowed to permeate since we were brought to these shores. And we are fighting wickedness 
in high places. So let's talk about that for a minute. Let's talk about wickedness in high places. Al Sharpton, <laughs> I once made the joke that Al Sharpton has dedicated his life to the improvement of the black man, Al Sharpton. This is true. This guy is a fraud. This guy's a fraudster. He's a, a, a hater. He is an evildoer, and he has been for a long, long time. In 19, I think it was 87, but it was back in the 80s, there was a young girl named Tawana Brawley, a teenage girl named Tawana Brawley, who falsely claimed that she was raped. Sharpton, his top advisors say that Sharpton suspected that this was a hoax, but he became her, quote, advisor. He accused a police officer of the rape, and the cop, who was already a, a troubled guy, killed himself. And then Sharpton accused another man of killing the cop because he didn't want to take responsibility of him uh, for it. In Crown Heights, uh, this is 1991, a black child was accidentally killed by a car in a car accident, uh, and the car was driven by a Hasidic Jew and a small gang of local blacks murdered a Jewish man uh, who was, had nothing to do with anything. They just picked him out and killed him uh, in retaliation. Al Sharpton then stirred up anti-Jewish riots, basically to cover up that act, the murder. They, he stirred up anti-Jewish riots that were declared some of the most an- worst anti-Semitic incidents, one of the most anti-Semitic, sorry, one of the worst anti-Semitic incidents in United States history, the riot, the Crown Heights riots. 1995, Al Sharpton helped incite a boycott against a Jewish star, uh, store in Brooklyn. He inspired the protesters, protesters who had days of protests, which finally only ended when one angry protester shot four whites in the man's store and then set the place on fire, killing seven people, most of whom were Hispanic. Al Sharpton, the work of Al Sharpton, again, we remember the three white lacrosse players he accused falsely or helped accuse falsely of committing a rape of a black woman that they did not commit. Uh, He helped stir up the Michael Brown riots. And we remember the gentle giant Michael Brown, another incident like this, who was seen even by Obama's Justice Department, was found to have attacked, assaulted a police officer and gotten shot in that act. And that became uh, the Ferguson riots, which have left which left Ferguson virtually unpoliced, virtually destroyed in uh, near St. Louis and really destroy this. So that's who's talking at that funeral. That's who's talking about wickedness in high places. Al Sharpton, who, by the way, all this time <laughs> owes the government four point five million dollars in taxes. Right now, it's not it is not just black people who elevate the worst to uh, to lead them. Right. It is not that, you know, obviously Hillary Clinton was a major leader. Teddy Kennedy, the lion of the Senate who left his girlfriend to drown. And we get hit all the time with the bad behavior. And he does commit bad acts of uh, Donald Trump. We get hit with that. But the point is, we're held to that responsibility. We have to answer for the responsibility of our leaders. They don't. The blacks don't. The left doesn't. And what does that do to them? It, it degrades both the, both the blacks and the left. It degrades anybody who is under the aegis of the left, is degraded by the fact that their evildoers are elevated to high places while the media turns a blind eye. A blind eye. Barack Obama had Al Sharpton continually coming to him, talking to him. And, and under Barack Obama, the relations between whites and blacks got worse. What were they talking about? What were they gaming? What was going on in the scandal free, the scandal free Clinton uh, Obama administration? Right. So, you know, this is the thing. It's it's not it is not that we can't talk to somebody like the general in the Air Force, who is now the head of the Air Force, the first guy to lead the first African-American to lead a major branch of the military. Colin Powell, Colin Powell was just uh, he was the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, but he never led one of the branches of the military. Right. Instead of talking to that guy who we can talk to, he tells us things about his life as a black man in a conservative organization, in a an organization that we all respect and look up to. He's talking about his life. Anybody can hear that. Just like we heard the Jews when they talked about what it was like for them and they first came into the country coming out, just like we heard from the Irishmen and the Italians. And we know this is a long standing story. The black story is different it, because they were brought over as slaves. And because of Jim Crow, that does make their story different. It makes it more intractable. The fact that they wear their race on the, their skin color, although that doesn't seem to hurt Asians. So maybe that's not as big a deal as they think it is. But still, still, this is a long, long history going on. And of course, we can listen to that. But why are we listening to Al Sharpton? Why are we elevating the Michael Browns and the, and the George Floyds? You know, that is the point. I don't, I don't want to run the guy down. I don't want to, you know, I know his family's mourning and all this. And that's not the point at all. My point is simply that if you're, 
My point is simply this. Everything that divides us, that creates race, comes from the racists. It comes from the racists. I've said this before. Leftism is racism. Identity politics is racism. It never makes anything better. It doesn't make anything better to treat one another differently if we're all going to be Americans. Diversity is not our strength. Diversity is not our strength. Western culture is our strength. The culture of America is our strength that allows us allows diverse people to live together in peace. That's never happened. That's an experiment we're doing. It is an experiment we're doing, and it was it was working. It was getting better in the 60s. It was getting better until this incredible barrage of uh, great society handouts and entitlements created this barrier between one race and another. Basically, it was the idea was one race was going to work and be fine and live their lives. And then the other race was going to be given this money. And I keep saying this about everybody, not just about blacks. If you give people money, if you don't give them jobs, if they don't, their life doesn't have meaning, that's not helpful. That just creates dependency. It's like a drug. It's just, you know, giving out welfare, giving out uh, uh, unemployment that is more than you would make with a job. It's the same. It's the same as giving somebody meth. It's the same as giving somebody something that they can't get off. I mean, not everybody's going to get addicted, but a lot of people are going to be addicted. And of course, what they're addicted to is the Democratic Party. Party and the bureaucracy that keeps that party in place, which is a bureaucracy of welfare that is basically just a way of giving out patronage jobs. And of course, a lot of that money never makes it to the people it's supposed to go to in the uh, in the end anyway. But, you know, here's the thing. There are lots of voices, not just white voices. There are lots of voices, even on the left, who know this. There are lots of voices, even on the left, who know this. Again, it's always the wall of lies between us that is the problem. There was a phone call between the idiot mayor of Chicago, Lori Lightfoot, where black people were being shot down like, you know, like targets every day. They had a day of riots. There was looting. There were 48 shootings. There were 17 murders. There were over 100 police officers injured. And they had a conference call with the aldermen, the people who run the city. And one of the aldermen uh, was a guy named Ramon Lopez, and he's a big critic of uh, Lori Lightfoot. And he started to tell her what was going on in his neighborhood. And this is her response. I got gangbangers with AK-47s walking around right now, just waiting to settle some scores. What are we going to do and what do we tell our residents other than good faith people stand up? It's not going to be enough. I think you're 100% full of is what I think. If you think oh, we no want offense, to... No you then. Who are you, you to tell me I'm full of And if you think, if you think we were not ready and we stood by and let the neighborhood go up, there's nothing intelligent that I can say to you. You know, it's like, thanks very much and shut up. I want to play cut one as well. This is Leo Terrell versus Cornell West on The Hannity Show. As Leo Terrell, a civil rights lawyer, is trying to tell Cornell West that you need education, you need marriage, you need other things. You cannot defund the police when Cornell West refuses to say he won't defund the police. He won't support that. Cut one. There's looting going on, and you try, and you try, you try to conflate. Oh, it's my turn. It's my turn. You try to conflate. You try to conflate protesting and police misconduct. And shame on you. And you're absolutely wrong. You won't address the issue. You will refuse to address the issue because I'm talking to you. I'm talking. To you. You're not my brother. You're not my brother. You're you are you are hurting black people by acting this position. You are taking the wrong position. That's t- no, my brother. That stuff plays out. Are that plays out. Too? Address the question. Do you? Oh my gosh! You have lost control. You're a dinosaur. You're an outright Negro. dinosaur. That's a tactic that Cornell West uses. He uses it all the time. He talks in this flowery, loving way. And then the minute somebody presents him with the facts, he begins to shout them down. It's a performance, but it's a performance with a point. The point is, shut up. These people are trying to talk. These people like Leo Terrell and this guy, this leftist alderman in Chicago, they're trying to tell the truth. They try, they're trying to, but the establishment is telling them the message, shut up. And they're telling it to us too. We can be friends. We can talk together. We can help things, but we can't do it as long as this empire of lies is passing on that message. You know, the other thing that just completely divides us is this double standard. And the double standard, you know, as I'm watching, as I'm watching this funeral, I think a lot of people were thinking the same thing. They were thinking, well, uh, two weeks ago, I, I couldn't go and sit by my mother while she died. Two weeks ago, I couldn't invite anybody to my wedding. Two weeks ago, I couldn't uh, invite anybody to my mother's funeral. You know, I mean, 
all of these things that that broke people's hearts that that you would you know we were reading the newspaper in tears about these stories and trusting to some degree some of us to the experts who were telling us this was necessary it was necessary that your your grandmother died alone it was necessary that no one could come to your father's funeral it was necessary that you couldn't get married in front of your friends and now suddenly we're having this massive funeral and everybody is looking at, sitting there and thinking uh, you know, what, what is this? What is, what's going on here? You know, the first amendment protects the right to, to worship. And yet the churches are closed and it protects the right to protest peacefully. And yet people are protesting in massive, massive numbers. Where, where is the double standard? Health experts are suddenly the expertise is suddenly, oh, well, you know, yeah, the, the Chinese flu uh, spreads, but this is more important. It's more important. Well, why isn't praying to God more important? I mean, how is that? How can you say to me, uh, we have to bring everybody together, this systemic racism? Where's that? That's systemic racism. That is systemic racism. The people who are say, telling you they're your friends are not your friends. What, what would I say to a friend? What would I say to a friend if he told me, oh, well, everybody has privilege that I don't have? I would say, man, as my friend, as a friend to a friend, sack up. Forget about the fact that life is unfair. LeBron James has talent that I'll never have, and he makes money for putting a ball through a hoop where I, for being an absolute brilliant guy, don't make that kind of money. That You know, life is unfair. Do your thing. Do what God has sent you to do, which is not to whine and not to complain about the unfairness of life, but to get on your horse and do what you're supposed to do. That's what I would say to a friend. If a friend came to me and said, oh, you know, the, the police are bothering me, I would say, hey, you know, are, are you are you taking drugs? Are you committing crimes? Are you driving at 100 miles an hour on the freeway? Are you are you doing the things that you need to do to get your children educated? Did you marry the woman who has your children? That's what I would say to a friend. That's what I would say to a pal. You know, I would take them aside. <laughs> you ask anybody, you ask any of my friends and they'll tell you that's what I would say. You know, what is it suddenly that I can't say that to you because your skin happens to be brown? It's the racists who create the race. It's the racists who create the race. And what the left has done has accepted, accepted the values of the racists, uh, of the racists. Are, were there racists in this country? Were there racist systems, systemic racism in this country? You bet there were. You bet they were. And they targeted African-Americans specifically. And there's legacies of that. And my heart bleeds for it. But they, the thing is, the past will never be fixed. The past will never be fixed. It can only be let go. And the only people who can let go are the victims. It's totally unfair. It's a totally unfair system. But I didn't make it. That's the system. And you know what? Crying about it, yelling about it, screaming at me about it doesn't change one thing, not one little thing. It's still the system. You got to forgive and let go. When Jesus said forgive, he wasn't talking about people forgive after this, forgive after that. He was just talking about letting it go. Let it go. It's listen, I always say this, you know, if you listen to Jesus, he wasn't like telling you do this or, you know, a big lightning bolt is going to hit you. He's telling you do this and you'll have a better life. This is what I would say to a friend. Why am I not talking to my fellow citizens as friends just because their skin is black? It's because the racists create the race and the racists are where they've always been. They're in the Democrat Party and now they're in the media and now they're in the academy and now they're accepting Oscars. You know, they took uh, Gone with the Wind off HBO Max. Now, they said they're going to put it back up there. And of course, it's, it's selling off Amazon like crazy. And, and you should, by the way, you should buy movies in, in disc form so you can watch them so they can't pull this garbage. But, but they pulled down Gone with the Wind. Now, Gone with the Wind is a great movie. It's a great movie. And do I cringe a little bit when I watch it? Yeah, but that's the past. The past, you know, sometimes makes us cringe. You know, we, we change, our attitudes change, things change. But I want to hear from the past because without the past, we've only got the present. We don't know anything, right? And this is, and it's a great movie. It is one of the most entertaining movies ever made. It may be one of the top three American movies ever made. And of course, it is the, uh, the first time a black person won an Academy Award. Hattie McDaniels, that's who played uh, Mammy in it. Uh, here's, here's a clip of her accepting the Hattie, Hattie McDaniel. That's what it was. Uh, here's her Oscar speech. Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Science, fellow members of the motion picture industry and honored guests. This is one of the happiest moments of my life. And I want to thank each one of you who had a part in selecting me for one of the awards. For your kindness, it has made me feel very, very humble. And I shall always hold it as a beacon for anything that I may be able to do in the future. I sincerely hope 
I shall always be a credit to my race and to the motion picture industry. My heart is too full to tell you just how I feel. And may I say thank you. <laughs> God bless you. That's a woman standing in a hotel where they didn't let black people in. That's a woman standing in a segregated hotel. David Oselznik, the, the great producer, he had to like deal with the hotel to allow her to come in. She wasn't allowed to sit with the other actors in the film. Clark Gable, God bless him, Clark Gable was con- was her good friend and was constantly fighting for her, uh, you know, protesting any time she was uh, left out of things. That was a woman who was genuinely struggling, right? You're an actor today. You may run into racism, but you're not running into anything, anything that that lady uh, like that, what that lady ran into. You're going to erase her achievement. You're going to erase the past and say, oh, I just, you know, I, I, you know, people are we all stand on the shoulders of giants. We're not flying. You know, these people on the left, they think they stand. They think they're flying around, but they're standing on the shoulders of a lot of people, white and black, just people good people, who, who flawed people, sinful people. They're standing on their shoulders with all the freedoms they have. You erase the past. You erase all that progress, all that work, all that achievement, and all that pain as well, all that sorrow and pain as well. What are they talking about? I and mean, what does it do to us now? What does it do to us now that I can't get, uh, you know, this great old movie? Because what? Because what? You know, somebody's going to be offended because someone's a little snowflake and can't stand to see that the past used to be different than the, you know, the past was different than the present, that the past is another country. How does that bring us together? How does that not separate us? You know, the, the thing about it is, if you want to be black forever, like the Native Americans, they want to be Indians forever. They, you know, they want to keep on the reservation. And look how that's worked out for them. Not so good. It doesn't work out that well. There's only one answer in a multi-ethnic society. And this is the multi-ethnic society. Here it is. It's not anywhere else. Look at the streets of China. They don't look as like the streets of New York. It's here. This is where the experiment is taking place. We know, we know the answer. The answer is you were made in the image of God. I'm going to treat you, you personally, not, not your race. Your race wasn't made in the image of God. You were made in the image of God. And that's the way I'm going to treat you. We know that's the answer. It's the only right answer. Is it hard? Yeah. But once you get to the mountain peak, every, every direction is down right? That's the top. The top is we treat each person like he's the image of God. And that's not going to happen with special favors. That's not going to happen if you defund the police. It's not going to happen if you defund the police and now I can't get a cop to come because, oh, you know, black lives matter. Again, every time they say black lives matter goes right up my my spine. I know what they're saying, except they are uh, basically an extremist leftist organization that's not really fighting for black lives. They're just fighting for leftism. So it doesn't matter to me what it, the slogan might mean all lives matter. Not all lives matter. Each life matters. Each life matters. And that's the thing. If we're not going to deal with each other as Americans and as individuals, we're screwed. We're screwed. This is an experiment. It can go terribly wrong, right? When you're down in the lab and you're mixing stuff together, different chemicals together, they can blow up in your face. They can leave you like the guys in the cartoon with your hair all in singes and ashes and things dripping off you. You know, that's what we can look like. Or, or, we can put this thing away. We can put it away. It's the only choice. It's the only choice. If I, you know, I'm telling you, if we don't speak to each other like friends speak, which is tough, if we don't speak to each other as individuals and as people, we're done. We're done. And that's what the left, that's the left's plan. That is basically the strategy of the empire of lies. All right. All you people who are whining about, you know, all access, you can't afford all access. You need food. You need rent. You know, <laughs> Well, we have a lower tier that gives you so many good things, and it's much, much cheaper. It's called the Reader's Pass. Usually it costs, what, about three bucks? Uh, Yeah, three bucks a month. But we are giving you the first month for 99 cents. That is one buck. And then it's $36 for the year after that. You get articles ad-free. You get the Daily Wire uh, exclusives. You get the app and all that stuff. You get lots and lots of great stuff. Uh, And uh, so, you know, first... Go over and unsubscribe from Knowles' YouTube channel and then go over to dailywire.com slash subscribe. And for a buck, you can test out the reader's pass. All right. The mailbag is coming up where your life matters. All right. The mailbag. All right. Uh, I want to start. We asked for for video uh, questions again. And and please, anytime you want to send in a video uh, to the mailbag that's less than a minute long. And we got one question a lot of times 
uh, in this one. A lot of people thinking about the same thing. I want to play the one of the trucker. I think his name was Nicholas. Is that the one, the longer one? Uh, play that one. Hi there, Clavin. My name's Nicholas, and I am a, I'm a trucker. I'm on the road all the time. I've been out since, uh, since the whole COVID thing started in March. So I've been watching all this chaos develop over the last couple of months, just from the seclusion of my truck and what I can see on my phone. And what, I, what I'm wondering is, up, up until now, I've never been nervous about the state of the world. I've never been afraid of what's going on. But after these riots last weekend, that started to break down for me. I don't know why, but I'm starting to, it feels like God's not in control almost, you know? And this is a, a new feeling for me, but I just wanna know what your belief is. Like, do you think that there's still hope for this country right now? And uh, I wish you all the best, thank you. Uh, well, the answer to, the, to that question, do I think that there's hope for this country is absolutely, absolutely, I think there's hope for this country. Are we going through a bad patch? We certainly are. We've had two crises. And, you know, these two crises are one crisis, right? The left has obviously used the George Floyd killing to cause as much trouble as possible. And it looks like right this minute, it looks like it's working. But remember, we've been locked down for three months. And that's part of the story, too. Uh, that would not, you know, all these people have lost their jobs. They closed the economy. It, the economy has not yet come back. Uh, and so that's a problem. And I have to tell you, I don't think Donald Trump is doing the right thing by staying silent. Uh, maybe he has some plan that's smarter than my plan. It's entirely possible. But I think he should come forward and make a speech. I think we need to hear from him. We need This is not something, you know, lead, that kind of leadership has to come from the top. And he has not done that. And I don't know why he hasn't done it, uh, but he needs to talk to all of us and tell us that things are, are going to be OK. But here's the thing. When you're watching this, you have to remember a couple of things that everything, all these feelings that you have about these things are relative. In the 30s, we had a massive depression in this country. In the 40s, we had a massive war, right? Uh, in the 60s, things went nuts. In one year, there were three major assassinations of, of leading figures, including, uh, you know, the brother of the president and the and Martin Luther King. I think that was all in one one year. Uh, there were just assassinations all over the place. A very violent time. The 70s, again, really, really tough economic times, high crime, really brutal. Ronald Reagan turned this country around. Now, Christopher Caldwell makes the argument that he did it by plunging us into debt. And now some of the price of that is coming uh, coming home to roost. And one of the things that happened is the civil rights laws have tangled up corporations in lawsuits that make them terrified. And so they are very likely to kowtow to the left and to the Black Lives Matter voices and suddenly say, oh, you know, we're, you know, Amazon is running things. Oh, we, we're in solidarity with the black race. Who cares? Who cares? Why aren't you in solidarity with everybody? with everybody, all Americans, because that's the way it's going to be or it's not going to be anything at all. So this kind of thing has been going on. There's, there's always turmoil in this country. Why? Because we are the country. We are the life of the world right now. We are the life of the world. We're the leading nation. Everybody watches us. Why are there protests all around the world about something that happened uh, in, in Minnesota? You know, why are there protests all around the world? Because they're all living in our country, in their heads. That's, that's it. And then when you are at the, at the forefront of things, there were wars in Europe for 2,000 years. Europe was at war with itself for 2,000 years. Big, bloody, ugly wars between the French and the English. We look at them and think, you're all the same people. What are you doing? Big wars, the Spanish and the English, the Spanish and the French, the French, everybody. They were always fighting. Now they don't fight wars anymore. And they think it's because they found the answer and it's uh, universal health care. No, it's because they don't matter anymore. We are the life of the world. The life of the world is always where the action takes place. And it's always where the turmoil is and all the big turmoil. So we're going through turmoil. We've been through turmoil before. We can survive. That doesn't mean we will survive. And it doesn't mean we will survive well. It doesn't mean we will. We may not. I don't know. You know nobody knows. That's that's the thing. But if you lose courage now, that doesn't help. If you despair now, what is the, as I always say, what is the purpose of despair? What's the plan when you despair? You know, some, some of my friends, they, they say, well, I'm just going to go to religion now. I'm going to just be with God and be at peace. And, and I understand that. I do understand it. It gets, it gets, we gets weary, you know. And I always tell them, if this country is going down into the tar pits, the last thing you're going to see is my clenched fist because I'm not going to let it go. I'm not going to let it go. So, so look, 
there's there's one the illusion that things have been peaceful because for 25 years we had 25 good years with a good economy and things were pretty peaceful during that time and now we've got a lot of turmoil so there's that illusion uh, that it's usually that things are supposed to be peaceful the other thing is is we are seeing things happening all over in our living room in our computer right now and it has an emotional effect on you and a lot of us a lot of you should get off twitter and should get off social media if you are feeling angry if you're depressed if you're constantly upset get off social media you don't need to know that an act of justice was committed uh, an act of injustice was committed in uh, chicago or in some other place there's always an act of injustice being committed always always all the time. The fact that it's in front of you right now changes your mood and changes your attitude. It's like the person who says, you know, I lost uh, my faith when my wife died in a plane accident. And you say, well, why didn't you lose your faith when somebody else's wife died in a plane accident, (laughs) right? It's the, the same thing. It's because the emotions are being driven by your personal life. So now you're seeing everything that happens and you've come out of a very quiet, prosperous time of 25 years. It basically ended in 2008. Uh, if not, if not with the with 9-11, but that time ended. And now we have this kind of shock of, of real struggle. The furniture is floating in the room. The gravity has gone out of the room and the furniture is floating around. We don't know where it's going to land. And that's frightening. It's frightening. I'm not telling you it's not. I'm just saying that this has happened before. We've come through. We've gotten better. Uh, hopefully we will again. But you're going to have to play. You're going to have to play the game of, of life and history, just like everybody else. Um, From Anonymous, hello, Lord Clavin. As a Christian, are you so sure about Trump? Uh, Like you have been largely supportive of of him while often bothered and annoyed by his bad rhetoric and vanity. Like you have been tolerant of it because I think he's an important barrier against leftism. He goes on and on. Uh, It's a very long letter. But he says, uh, do we go to all lengths to stave off leftism? Where do we draw the line? Well, I want to explain this uh, about how I felt about Trump from the beginning and how I feel about him today. Okay, because I've explained this to some of the most intelligent people I know. And I suddenly realized they don't understand me. I had a a talk, a chat with my son the other day, Spencer, who will be on uh, tomorrow talking about the Bible and other interesting uh, works of literature. Um, And I had a, a conversation with him where I said I suddenly realized that Americans don't understand what the word tragic means. In, two, in 2016, when we had an election between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, I said, this is a tragic election. And people thought, well, you don't support Trump or you support Hillary Clinton or, uh, you know, you think this is sad or whatever. Tragic doesn't mean sad. OK, that's not what it means. Tragic means there's no good outcome. Uh, my son put it this way. My son is a classic scholar. Spencer has a Ph.D. from Oxford in, in classics. And he said, tragic is when there are two things that you must do. One is you must avenge your parents' murder. And the other is you must not harm your parents. And then your mother murders your father, like in a Greek play, right? That's tragic. There's no way out of that situation. There's literally no way out. When you run a felon like Hillary Clinton against a bombastic, you know, um, a blunderbuss like Donald Trump, that's tragic. There's not a, there's not a good solution there. I chose what I thought was going to be the, the better solution, which was Trump. And I'm convinced it was indeed the better the better solution. But Trump is also in a tragic position. What is good about Trump is also destructive about Trump. What is good about Trump is he has the voice. He has the thick skin. He has the pugilism to fight back against the empire of lies. And he is the only Republican, the one maybe Ted Cruz. But I think Trump is the only Republican who understands that that's the fight we're in. We're not in a fight with Black Lives Matter. We're not in a fight with Antifa. We're in a fight with NBC. We're in a fight with ABC. We're in a fight with The New York Times. We're in a fight with Hollywood and the academies. And they we have to win that fight. If we don't win that fight, nothing else is going to matter. And Trump is the only person who understands that. And he's the only person with the hide and the thickness and the meanness to fight that fight. And because he is thick and because he's pugilistic and because he's mean, he's a very, very unappealing character. Now, he may not be unappealing to you, but he's unappealing to a lot of people. And he's he's insensitive. He is insensitive. And you say, oh, well, you know, why should we be insensitive? It's because we're all in this together. (laughs) You know, the far left may have left the building. The far left may have literally left the building. But most people are in this. Most of us are in this together, left and right. We really are because we're going to go down. We're not going to go down by ourselves. If If the left wins, we're all screwed. Right. You've seen what happened in Venezuela. It will happen here. And so we're all screwed if they win. But all of us are screwed. So we're all in this together trying to find a way forward. And Donald Trump has not been a uniting president. Now, 
Neither was Barack Obama. I get it. And Barack Obama gets away with it. I get it. But still, that, that is a pro- that's what I mean by tragic. So it's a tragic election. So as Christians, you ask me as Christians, do I support him even though uh, he does the wrong thing? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I mean, I support him because I think he is the best of our tragic choices right now. I hope we emerge into a new time when there are non-tragic choices, uh, and that'll be by the hand of God if it happens. But until that day happens, I'm going to support the better person with the better outcome because I think that's the Christian thing to do. I think the Christian thing to do is to do what will produce the least suffering for me and my neighbors and my country. And, And I think it's Trump. I think it's Trump. And I, you know, so I defend him in what he does. And I constantly say, you know, well, I don't like the rudeness and all this stuff. But I also understand this is a fight and you have to win. You have to win. So a lot of times I don't spend a lot of time knocking Trump because the left, I think I think that that job is covered. I think that the job of knocking Trump is being done. But that doesn't stop it from being a tragic situation. And in a tragic situation, you have to do the best you can and hope that God leads you out into the promised land. That's the only it's the only thing you can do. Um, all right, let's hear the shorter, uh, the shorter video question. Hey, Clavin. My question for you today is, if Eric Swallow votes for Joe Biden, am I black? And while you answer that, I'd just like to let you know I am an all-access member as of last week. And on that note, save the Clavin. <laughs> All right. That's Carl. Uh, Carl, if the question is, if Eric Swalwell votes for Joe Biden, am I black? And the answer is, yes, you are, uh, because Eric Swalwell is you. He said, I am you. Uh, and Joe Biden says, if you don't vote for me, uh, you ain't black. So if Swalwell votes for him, he is black and he is you. So you are black. So, yes, that's that's the answer. Um, from Stephanie, uh, dear Mr. Clavin, I'm 28 years old, a wife and a mother to a wonderful little boy. Tonight, I had a very sad and bitter conversation with my father on the state of the country. I posed the question of how we got got where we are and whether it was out of the right silence or ignorance. And if relying only on the vote in November would really save anything. I was coldly told that my most important job was raising my son. And she says, I believe that is my greatest role. But I argued that if we stood by and did nothing, uh, if the s- silent majority remained silent, our future would continue to be hijacked. Um, is it wrong for me to believe that the, the future is my responsibility in part? You know, I, I got two answers to this question. Of course, you're not wrong. Of course, you should take political action. Of course, your son comes first. You know that. I mean, obviously, being a mother is the most important job anybody has. Uh, and so you should do that first. But that doesn't stop you from taking political action, from speaking out and from doing things. That is So obviously, uh, uh, you know, your father may be speaking out of concern for you. He may be worried uh, about his his grandson. Um, but obviously, those are things that you can do. What got me about this letter, though, is why um, why were you coldly told uh, this? Why did you have um, a sad and bitter conversation? Uh, what's going on between you and your father that you can't have that conversation in a in a nice way, in a compassionate way, where he says, you know, I'm so concerned, you know, as your dad, I'm so worried about you as a grandfather, I'm so worried about you. I don't want you to stick your neck out where they you can make a decision about that on your own. He has the right to say what he has to say. But why is he cold uh, and bitter? And why why is that going on? So that's that's something that's not in the letter. And I don't know the answer to it. But I think that that's um, that's something you should really look into because that that's the problem. Obviously, you should take whatever action you deem uh, responsible and right and good. I mean, of course you should. Uh, being a mother doesn't take you out of the world. I mean, it's a, your first job, but it's not your own. We all have other things that we do. Uh, but why is it so hard for you to have that conversation in a loving, compassionate way with your father? That's the thing that uh, I ask about. Um, this is from Rich. Uh, as Durham looks into the basis of the Russia collusion hoax, yeah, we didn't get to that story. We'll have to get to it uh, tomorrow if we can. Um, and it seems it may go on forever. What happens if Trump is not reelected? Could Biden or whomever is elected simply turn off Durham and no one is held to account uh, or, and the truth is never told? Thanks and keep up the awesome work. Uh, yes, that's exactly what will happen. Uh, Barr, Durham's report will come out before the election. Uh, Barr said yesterday on the Brett Baer show that there would be people, uh, there are people who might be indicted uh, who, whose names we will know. He's already said it won't be Biden and it won't be Obama, but he said there are people who might be indicted whose names we will know. Uh, but they, the justice will not be done if the Democrats come to power because they cheat. Um, let's see, one more. From Kate. Oh, great and wise, Clavin, I have been dating my current boyfriend for about four and a half years. I'm 21 and he is almost 22. So four and a half years, that means you were 17. 
or 16. We are both in college and live together during the school year, and he lives at his mom's house during the summer. Every time I talk about marriage with him, he says he is not sure I am the person he wants to spend his life with. I don't know what I should do, but I know whatever you say is 100% correct. Please help me save the Clavin. Uh, yes, Kate, here's what you do. I want you to uh, dig a, a square hole in the floor of your apartment and attach a lever to it. Uh, and when your boyfriend comes home, ask him to stand on the square and then pull the lever and let him disappear down the trap door. After four and a half years, you've been together since high school. I, you know, I understand that you had to grow up. You had to grow up first. But don't throw your youth away on a guy who doesn't want to marry you. If he's not sure, let him leave. You know, let him leave. Yeah, I mean, really, you know, do not waste. Look, Young women are at their prettiest and their most fertile. They, you know, you're never going to be as pretty again as when you're young. You're never going to be as fertile again as when you're young. Young women should dedicate their early, uh, you know, their early parts of their lives, if they can, to marriage and children, and then move on into the professions. There is absolutely no reason for a woman to model her life on a man's life. That's a stupid idea, right? So why are you living with a guy who's not sure? Why are you living with a guy who's not sure whether you're the person he wants to spend his life with? You know, time for him to decide. You're 21. That's that's old enough. You've been together a long time. He should decide, if not kick him, turf him. All right, I gotta, I gotta stop there. You asked, 100% correct. Will change your life, hopefully for the better. I will talk to you again tomorrow. I'm Andrew Claven. This is The Andrew Claven Show. The Andrew Claven Show is produced by Robert Sterling. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Technical producer, Austin Stevens. And our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. Assistant director, Pavel Wydowski. Edited by Adam Saievitz. Audio mixed by Robin Fenderson. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Alvera. Animations are by Cynthia Angulo. Production assistants, McKenna Waters and Ryan Love. The Andrew Claven Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2020. Candy companies issue statements on the race riots. Never thought I would say that. The crime rate soars and the experts change their tune on coronavirus yet again. Check it out on The Michael Knowles Show.